When we typically think about sacrifice, we might think of, you know, pouring a burnt offering on a fire, or perhaps some of the more extreme examples of Aztec human sacrifice and the like. And we are perhaps unlikely, given those few examples and the way that this is typically presented to us, to connect this with magic and witchcraft. But there is a, a substantial argument that can be made by looking at the elements of what's going on in sacrifice that allows us to connect these two worlds together. So let's take a closer look. When we think about sacrifice, we're thinking about several different elements. So you have the person doing the sacrifice, you have the material or animal or human being sacrificed, you have the time and place that the sacrifice occurs. You have the ostensible reason for it connected to mythology, perhaps a you know, continuation of uh, archetypal cycles, the sustainment of nature, you know, causing the sun to continue to rise, the crops to grow, uh, and so on. So there are a variety of concerns that are associated with this. And what we're going to see in looking at the theories of sacrifice is that the different theorists have historically placed emphasis on different elements. Some saying that the time and place might be more appropriate, that uh, might be more important. So the sustaining of uh, nature, the relation to the cyclical conception of time, the archetypal function of the sacrifice, involving man in, in that man is ephemeral, a temporal and contingent thing, something that exists within time in a single human lifetime then, by this account, by this thinking with uh, that, that conception of time, doesn't have significance on its own, but has significance in relation to the archetypes. In other words, in relation to the overall motions of nature, the things that happen every day. So an individual rising of the sun may not have that much significance, but the fact that the sun rises and does so every day, and this is part of the infinite cycle of nature, that has significance. And since sacrifice can, in part, be conceived of tying man to that archetypal succession and imbuing then his ephemeral manifestation, his particular activities with significance in doing so, that may be uh, one possibility, one way of explaining it. So in other words, my individual eating of a meal may not have any real significance in terms of the long time. So if you consider, as many of these societies did, that time goes back infinitely, it stretches out, repeats itself over and over again, and will continue on forever. My individual manifestation of right here, right now, today is meaningless. It is meaningless unless it is connected to, or in, in other words, insofar only as it is connected to what is archetypal, what is eternal. And so by offering a prayer of thanks, let's say, before a meal, by involving myself perhaps morally in a change with respect to my disposition in approaching that meal, I can tie myself to the eternal, or I can create a bond between myself and the eternal and increase my participation in what is archetypal, what is eternal, what is above the prosaic here and now, the human. Now, I've kind of taken that parenthetically and applied a bunch of different theories that we're going to be hearing about. But nevertheless, that gives you some flavor of the different ways that this can be, uh, that this can be interpreted. Now, one of the questions that's, that needs to be asked, and I, I open this by connecting magic and sacrifice, and in this way I think we, we should be thinking about it. With respect to magic, we're typically thinking about, you know, a particular action, uh, being able to influence the gods or influence nature, having some kind of power in a presumably invisible or otherwise arcane fashion, something other than just pushing on something. So, you know, me pushing on a rock and moving it from one place to another is not necessarily magical, but the imprint that one leaves on one's clothing, for instance, and my ability to influence one of my enemies by having a scrap of his clothing, that is a, uh, a bit of a different story. And in what way exactly that works, if it has something to do with the gods, this is where things become interesting because by participating in a magical ritual, 
by involving magic, we're implying that we can somehow influence things, that we as people can have power over these greater forces. And so magic then is a kind of, and has been thought of as a kind of proto-science, you know, being able to use tools and so you manipulate the keys on the organ of nature to produce certain harmonies, certain sounds, and certain effects. And that gives man a control over nature, a power over nature. And so his relation to the divine then is not one of supplication. It's not one of devotion. In other words, it's not the kind of uh, humble prayer that we typically associate with religion in modern, especially modern Western societies, right? With the Abrahamic religions, typically prayer is devotional. And it's something that is, um, you know, putting the, the individual at a, uh, a greatly lesser position in comparison to the eternal, in comparison to the, in Christianity, the angels, and, and so on. And uh, this is not at all what's going on in magical rites, typically. With sacrifice, we start to see something a bit different. And uh, I'm thinking of uh, Evans Pritchard's work in particular, and thinking of sacrifice as primarily wanting to keep the gods at bay and wanting to, and this is limited to a particular society, but and he, he, he recognized this, not wanting to overly generalize from those results, but at the same time, it's interesting that um, that seems to be one of the main mechanisms there, is to try and pacify the divine. There's a sense in which, you know, the, the burnt offerings must be offered in order to pacify the gods so as not to anger them and spoil the crops or the, you know, ability of women to go through labor without dying or, you know, the, this sort of thing. Any number of rather prosaic goods that would be important uh, to a people. So, Herein is where we find another important differentiation, and this is what we're going to, to start to see. And this was especially the case with German anthropology, and really anthropology in general in the 19th century keyed in on this sort of thing. And to a certain extent, it's, it's hard not to see what's going on. It's hard not to see some validity in the approach, but at the same time, there are also some deep concerns with what's presented. And what I mean is this. We're talking about stages. This visualization of, the conceptualization of religion in terms of stages and a progression. So there's this implied progression, and this was especially bad with respect to those who took Darwin's ideas and ran with it in terms of trying to, uh, to work with anthropo uh, anthropological theory in the, the late uh, 19th and early 20th centuries. There was a tendency to think, okay, we have these stages, there's this progression, and it's this linear sort of thing that, of course, ends in the highest form of society, which is wherever the anthropologist happens to, to inhabit. Uh, that may be a bit unfair uh, of an ad hominem sort of uh, uh, attack on it, but at the same time, it's it's hard not to to think of some of these things uh, in light of the the way that we can now look in hindsight, you know, 100 years, 150 years later, at some of these theories. What I wanted to bring out here was the uh, the transition from the hunter gatherer cultures to the agrarian cultures, and this is where we start seeing a really marked difference with uh, with this kind of thing. The emphasis on sacrifice. The types of myths that we see are, are completely different. But I simply mention this now to again keep this in mind with respect to in the context of the kind of stages approach, especially of German anthropology, but like I said in general for, uh, for anthropology in the 19th century and, and beyond. That being said, let's move on to the idea of reciprocity. Now, the gift by Marcel Mauss. Now, Mauss was a, an anthropologist whose work really came to the fore the early 20th century. We're talking about around 1920. And The Gift is an interesting essay. So the idea of reciprocity is one of, in the Latin, do ut des. Now this means I give so that you give. And what we're talking about here is with most the, um, the notion of a gift is one that is never truly without strings. 
It's one that we engage in the practice of gift giving so that we may receive gifts in return, so that we may receive something in return. In other words, there's an exchange. And this is what's meant by reciprocity. So we're talking about, of course, not only gifts between people, so we might conceive of, you know, the lavish banquets and whatnot that Boaz and others talked about, where uh, people became indebted to others. So, you know, I attend my friend's wedding and I have to give him a gift with the understanding that when I invite him to my wedding, he will have to bring me a gift and presumably there will be some kind of similar value and that sort of thing. And we do this even with Christmas gifts and whatnot. And I'm told that in anthropological circles, the discussion of this essay is often described as the one that uh, puts kind of a damper on Christmas. <laughs> we, we think of ourselves as a bit more altruistic, perhaps, than we really are when it comes to gift giving. And uh, by bringing some of these psychological um, facts to light, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect very kindly on us, depending upon what your uh, ethical disposition might happen to be. So, in addition to this reciprocity working between people, of course, we're also thinking with respect to the reciprocity that can be established between man and the divine. And this is where things really get interesting, because the idea of applying this notion to the sacrifice involves us in a, a kind of exchange that is not terribly clear. And this is what I really, I want to emphasize. I want to problematize the way in which we conceive of this exchange, because this is where we run into a lot of problems. A lot of oversimplification gets done here. And especially if you're watching, let's say, a you know, television special on sacrifice or something of the kind, you're likely to hear sacrifice being put in analogous terms to the sort of gift giving that we might do with another person in the sense that I'm going to give, you know, this particular God something so that um, she might, you know, oversee a bountiful harvest. And it might be left at that. And I think if it's left at that, then we run the risk of uh, really underestimating what's going on in sacrifice. And this is where the reading by Fraser is, is wonderful. Because even though, uh, as I, I tried to, to caveat and tried to warn, <laughs> tried to warn you, Fraser may overstep his bounds and may very likely offend uh, some or many of you in talking about Christianity, but involving it in the conversation is essential. And so, regardless of the validity of his conclusions, it's important to also talk about the Eucharist with respect to uh, a discussion of sacrifice. And with the Eucharist in Christianity, what we're talking about is the transubstantiation of the host. So the, uh, the, the bread and, and wine uh, being transformed into the blood and body of Christ in however it is that we want to theologically conceive of that happening. And by that, I don't mean that it's relativized. I mean that there are a lot of different theological disputes with respect to this kind of thing. And that's not our interest today. But the point is, what we have here is the consuming of something that is sacred. It's something that has been sacralized. It has been blessed and transubstantiated, has been transformed by the priest. This is one of the special powers of the, the priest. Um, and in doing so, there is an element of the sacred that is involved in that ritual that really makes things very interesting. Because what you're doing here then is suggesting not only, you know, oh, well, you have a person who's eating the God and there are certain implications of that in terms of, you know, having power over the God or becoming the God or that kind of thing. And, and particularly the latter is, is very interesting, that of taking in the divine and becoming it. But the overall mechanism that I want to point out here is the relation, the way in which sacrifice establishes a relation between the human world and the divine. And so establishing this link and really throwing into, uh, casting into focus the relationship between, in the way that we should understand the relationship between the human world and the divine. And we're accustomed to conceiving of this as totally separate. And in the West, in the, especially, I think, modern lay forms of Christianity, we typically think of the divine as something kind of out there, something very separate from the prosaic world of things. 
And this is something that really became exaggerated in medieval Christianity with nominalism. So anyway, we'll get to that. But um, suffice to say, it's the same kind of thing that we want to bring out. If the human world and our individual existence is something that's wrapped up in temporal things, contingency, in other words, life and death, the, the idea that my human life and my individual existence is something mortal in the same way that things are mortal and things are destructible, in other words, so you have a you know ear of corn that was not there last year that has somehow come into material existence and can be destroyed in the same way that my own uh, life comes into existence and can be destroyed. And there's a certain link uh, to be established there. And I think there's a certain key with respect to not only analogy, but the way that we can understand the nature of what is sacrificed that, uh, that links the divine and the human. Now, one of the important things here to see is the difference between a, a cyclical conception of history and a linear conception of history. And this is where Eliade is going to be particularly useful, Mircea Eliade, and uh, in describing and trying to make real to us what it's like to live in a cyclical conception of history. And this is where we have um, an archetypal association with things. And so, as I mentioned earlier, the ephemeral human world, the world of contingency and life and death, is something that is at once differently conceived than the divine world of archetypes, but at the same time entirely enmeshed with it. And so our lives, while they are our individual lives, it is something that is here and now and contingent, it's at the same time not removed at all from the archetypes. And this is one of the functions of ritual in many rituals in these societies is to establish and put one into um, communion with, uh, establishing a bond with the rhythms of nature and the things that are eternal. And so by participating in the things that are eternal in the name of or even embodied by a particular God, one participates deeply in the divine. In other words, let me do this by way of example. This is one that Levi Brule uses and this is from about 1930, I believe. The myth here that's important is uh, there, was, there was an anthropologist who was observing this fisherman. And uh, the fisherman told him that he was going to be fishing and he was going to become Kavavia to successfully fish. And said that I am not just you know, taking on attributes of him, this sort of thing. I am him. And so when I do this, I am uh, Kivavia. And um, this is a level of identification that we're going to be at pains to try and understand because understanding how it is that this is different than the kind of identification that we typically think about with respect to what's possible in ritual is really a huge gulf. Um, this is embodied, I think, very well exemplified by one of Joseph Campbell's favorite stories to tell with respect to metaphor. And uh, he was on a, a radio show one time, and he says that uh, he was being interviewed, and the particular statement in question was, John is a deer. And the, the host wanted to say, okay, you know, it's a metaphor, that's fine, so John is like a deer. And Campbell said, no, it's not John is like a deer, that would be a simile, it's that John is a deer, and the host was confused, and as if to say, well, you can't possibly mean that he, he is, you know, that he literally is a deer. I mean, as if, well, that doesn't make any sense. That kind of identification is impossible. And Campbell was taken aback as if to say, well, I don't want to offend the poor man, but he doesn't seem to understand what a metaphor is. <laughs> now, this is, I think Campbell is understating the problem in, in some regard. This is not a simple mistake. Uh, for someone to make. It's not as though all educated people should know should know better. S but at the same time, it directly addresses the problem of identification that I want to point to here with ritual. And the essence of it is this. 
what is meant by the fisherman becoming Kavavia or being Kavavia is that he participated in what was archetypal for the purpose of his fishing. In other words, while he was fishing, he was the God. He was not like the God, he was the God. And this is this presence, this imminence, that the, the divine is imminent in nature. It is all around us. And that's really the key difference, I think, because we're accustomed to thinking of the profane world of what we're used to seeing and the divine as being just completely different. You know, thou shalt not cross the gulf between the two. And for traditional societies, this really isn't, this really isn't the case. It increasingly becomes the case with sacrifice. As we are moving toward, and this is what I alluded to before with the stages, as we are moving toward a more devotional attitude toward the gods, as we are moving toward a propitiation of the gods and a, you know, laying oneself at the feet of the, you know, at, of the god uh, for the purpose of humbling oneself, saying that, you know, that what is human is small, what is divine is great. Uh, this is to depart in a significant fashion from the world of magic and move closer to um, what we are more familiar with. Now, there are certain economic factors to be considered here, and I don't want to overestimate or overstate the importance of uh, economics and the way that one gathers food and does things and exchanges power and that sort of thing um, with religion, but it's also impossible not to notice that religion is at least partially a reflection of the way that society is structured economically. In a hunter-gatherer society, you have certain kinds of myths. In an agrarian society, you have a very different sort of set of myths, and then above and beyond and outward from there. And so where you have small societies, things are different than they would be with very large societies. And if the conception of the deity also grows, as society grows and man becomes ever more distant from the ability to sustain himself by himself and is um, uh, completely wrapped in the society that he is a part of and perhaps subjugated by the society he is a part of, then we see a very different sort of thing going on in myth and ritual and religion. And that is crucial. Again, I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to say that what is religious is, ne is necessarily derived only from what is economic, uh, as has been stated. But at the same time, it's important to keep these things in mind and question what is the ritual there and what is religion really doing? What kind of um, psychological impact do these rituals and rites have? And this is something that we'll see much more when we get to the 20th century and we start talking about people like uh, Freud and, and Jung and beyond. Which, by the way, uh, Campbell is in that school. So when you read Campbell, um, you're also reading effectively a Jungian. Um, he takes a great deal of influence from Jung and uh, that school of depth psychology more broadly. Theories of sacrifice. So as promised, we're going to cover a number of different thinkers rather quickly, simply to give you a flavor for what has been said about this, the different ways that one can think about it. And I think there's going to be value in doing this relatively quickly because it's going to give you a sampling of a lot of different ways of thinking about the problem of what sacrifice is. So let's get started. First is Edward Burnett Tyler. So we're talking here about around 1870. So this is the late 19th century uh, with his work. Now, Tyler conceived principally of uh, sacrifice in terms of, as I mentioned with Evans Pritchard before, defraying divine hostility, so pacifying the gods. And this is something that is certainly uh, a part of some sacrifices, but does it encompass all of them? Well, I mean, that's part of the problem here is that we have a lot of different kinds of sacrifice. And um, with Tyler in particular, we don't see... Um, the, uh, for instance, the sacrificial meal in which one partakes of the animal that's sacrificed. That kind of thing is only awkwardly um, understood in terms of defraying divine hostility. So, influential work from Tyler, but it's hard not to think that it doesn't encompass everything. 
Now, with William Robinson Smith, along the same time, we have more emphasis on communion, on the bond being uh, created. So this is the, the joining of the, the sacred and the profane. And as I mentioned before in the discussion of Mos, the idea of reciprocity here is very interesting with respect to, with respect to sacrifice. And this involves questions of what, what is the nature of the communion? What is the nature of the bond that one is trying to establish with the sacrifice? What is the nature of the relation between the human and the divine? Is it an entirely effacing of the human identity in preference of what is divine, so becoming divine for a time? Uh, is it simply establishing a kind of flow or conduit whereas, whereby one can channel uh, divine power, favor, for practical purposes uh, or, or so on? Or is the communion one that more changes uh, the individual person, changing the constitution, the psychological well-being of the individual. Now, that last statement should not be a throwaway. This is something that we really don't get quite with his theory, but it's also something that we can too easily think is important and too easily think that people from traditional societies would understand because one of the key features, and this is again something that we're going to come back to repeatedly because it's something that's important with respect to trying to understand what changes in religious history. Because fundamentally one of the things that changes is the conception of the individual. And the way that one thinks about individual life in the context of traditional societies that are involved in a cyclical paradigm of time is very different than the sort of significance that we provide to an individual life right now. Now, the idea that I am an individual responsible for the ideas and actions that I have and that I can be a creative genius that can go out and create works of art or innovations and that sort of thing, that's a modern idea of the individual. This is something that we really don't get until the Renaissance. And it's not a coincidence that we start seeing figures like Leonardo da Vinci at the time that we do. And so we'll talk about more of that as we approach that particular point in history circa six to seven hundred years ago.